This podcast is brought to you by Villanova University on iTunes U. Please visit us on itunes.villanova.edu. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, Freedom School talk on racism and sports. I'm Rick Eckstein from the Sociology Department, formerly from the Peace and Justice uh, the Center for Peace and Justice Education, where I'm on temporary uh, leave. This is. Uh, Now this isn't working, huh? This, uh, the stuff we're going to talk about today is part of a book that I've been working on and I'm almost done with called, can, can you see this at all? I mean, I don't care if you can see this. I just want you to see the, the charts in a little while. Uh, the, the book is called Pay to Play, uh, Higher Education, Title IX, and the Commercialization of Girls' Youth Sports. And even though the book is mostly about girls and, inter and women at the intercollegiate level, we're also going to talk about uh, males today and look at one little piece of racism in sports. There's so many things. If we want to talk about racism in sports, both how sports can kind of challenge racism and how sports can uh, perpetuate racism, th there's a thousand topics we can choose from. And I'm just looking at one little piece today in hopes that we can have an interesting conversation. So what we're going to look at is the percentages of intercollegiate athletes both male and female, at both the Division I and the Division III levels, and where their racial and ethnic breakdowns fall, and how that compares to students as a whole, and to see if people from certain racial or ethnic groups are overrepresented or underrepresented among intercollegiate athletes. Okay. Now, what we got here, though, is a very complicated factor. In this case, race is really a proxy for social class is what's going on with, with what I call this pay-to-play youth sports pipeline. Right, there's a pipeline that exists between youth sports and intercollegiate athletics. And it's very expensive. It's increasingly expensive. Uh, it's increasingly elite. It's increasingly exclusive. It keeps people out from entering the pipeline and ending up in some intercollegiate athletic slot because they can't afford to get into the pipeline in the first place. So in the, in the sense that race and ethnicity has some kind of class component to it, and certain racial and ethnic groups are <coughs> overrepresented or underrepresented in lower income categories, you see this reflected in the racial breakdown. Now the data that exists from the NCAA and the National, or the National Center of Education Statistics doesn't always break things down by class, by family income. So we use race sometimes as a proxy, but it's, it's not an exact proxy. And a lot of the data that have been collected are at such a sort of vague aggregate level, it's hard to make specific arguments about them, but it's the best we can do. So I want you to take these things in our discussion with a little bit of a grain of salt, because I'm, I'm not saying this is absolute science and this stuff is absolutely correct, but it's suggesting things are, uh, there are cer certain patterns here that seem pretty clear. So we'll look at them in a tiny, tiny fashion. Should we turn out lights? What do you think? It would be better without lights or? Uh, no, you need the lights? The CBS back there needs the lights. All right, so we'll, we'll keep that going. Could pass us around. If you, if you need to come closer, we've got some, we've got some seats in the front. Now this is, uh, this is Division I male sports at, uh, throughout the United States. So it's not controlling for private schools versus public schools. It's not controlling for flagship schools, let's say the University of Texas or the University of Michigan, and smaller state schools. I think if you did that, you would find very interesting patterns between and among those schools. But all we can do is look at Division I as a whole. So these are, these are scholarship schools. These are schools that give some kind of scholarship, a certain number, far fewer than you think in most sports and for far less than you think in most sports, and sometimes nothing at all in most sports. But they're also sometimes associated with some kind of preferential admissions. Right? Recruited athletes at the Division I level usually get admitted ahead of time. It's almost like a, an institutionalized early decision program. Right? If you make a commitment in a certain way, and there's an actual form that you sign at the Division I level, then you're, you're committed. The letter of intent commits you to that school and, and you're in place. Uh, so this is how it breaks down. And, and again, I don't know, and my screen's dusty too. Ah, that's much better. 
So I don't know if you can see over here on the left. Ooh, ooh, we may have an HDMI cable here. No, that's fine. The breakdown in, in 2014, this is for 2014. The data I've looked at are from 2014 and 2000. Uh, 2014, the breakdown of college students by racial and ethnic categories is roughly parallel to the breakdown in the society as a whole. Now, again, if you look at different kinds of schools, that's going to vary. If you look at these flagship schools, so let's say the University of Michigan or the University of Texas at Austin, you're going to find a smaller percentage of what we might call racial or ethnic minorities. At the smaller state schools, you'll probably find a larger percentage. But in any case, overall, all these Division I schools, the breakdown is pretty much the same. So it's roughly 67% white, 12% uh, each of African American and Latino, and roughly 8 or 9% of what they call Asian slash Pacific Islander. That's their categories. I would come up with, well, I just wouldn't use that term, but that's the term that they use. So that, that, that's how the breakdown is. So if we were to look at intercollegiate athletics and say that it's roughly representative of the population as a whole, we would expect the sports to break down similarly. But they don't. Right? The breakdown of the sports doesn't parallel and mirror what's happening in the student body as a whole. Can I tell you how pretty they are? Brendan, can you see this? <coughs> All right, so uh, th these are just, I've just put these sports because I like them and they were interesting and showed different, different patterns. So what do you see that's interesting here? What, what, is, what does anyone see that's interesting? What do you see that's interesting? Uh, baseball. Are you a baseball player? Yeah, we're all baseball players. Jesus, I can't get away from you. You're in class, you're here. White. Baseball players are primarily white, all right? So almost 90% right, are, are white. And the percentage of African-American baseball players is pretty small, surprisingly small. This is one of the things that surprises people sometimes, because baseball has a reputation uh, of being fairly accommodating and open to African-Americans and Latinos. Uh, now, what's happened is, is, if you know at the professional level, too, the percentage of African-Americans has been declining pretty steadily since the 1970s. The percentage of Latinos at the professional level has been increasing since the 1970s. But that's a, pretty, that's a pretty small number compared to what it used to be. If you had gone back 30 or 40 years, uh, it would probably have been higher. And, and my argument against this, uh, about this, and maybe you guys have experienced this, is that baseball has become a pay-to-play system also. And most of the recruitment that goes on by Division I coaches and Division I programs happens in a, a non-high school setting. It happens with uh, American Legion ball or summer ball or some kind of elite travel setting. And that costs money. And in order to get into that system and be on a travel team and go to the tournaments and go to the showcase tournaments and be recognized and get into that pipeline, you've got to have some, some resources. All right. a basketball and football, you see African Americans are very much overrepresented at this level. It's going to be a little bit different at the, at the D3 level, but at the D1 level. Now again, this is going to vary by school and type of school and prominence of school. And I, I, I can't, I have to go to each school individually and count them. And I didn't have time last night to do that. Uh, anything else that you see here that's, that's <coughs> interesting or that's surprising to you in terms of the breakdown of, of this? Anything catch you by surprise? Larger than you thought? Smaller than you thought? Anything at all? Besides the baseball. We've got baseball taken care of now. Which of these do you think is the fastest growing sport in terms of the number of scholarships and the number as well in Division Three, where there are no scholarships, but they have the same kind of preferential admissions for athletes? Which of these sports do you think is showing the largest growth? You've got a one in six chance of being right. Which one? Lacrosse. Lacrosse is, is the second largest growth. But you play lacrosse? You play soccer. It's on your thing. You stole that shirt. Right? I did. I thought so. So lacrosse would be the second fastest growing one. What's the first fastest growing one? It's, it's growing even faster among women than it is among men. Brendan, you don't know. What? 
It is hockey. It is hockey. That's right. It's ice hockey. Ice hockey is the fastest growing. Now, women's sports is growing much faster than men's sports. It has to do with Title IX and other things, which is why that's, why that's what I'm focusing on in my book, because women's sports is just expanding much more quickly than men's sports. But hockey is the fastest, and hockey is, is the most, hockey is the whitest of the sports. Now, what's this gap up here, do you think, for, uh, for hockey? It doesn't reach 100. Right? And even if you include Native Americans, which is another category, which usually doesn't register, it doesn't, it doesn't get close to 100. There's also a little gap here in track. In lacrosse, there shouldn't be a gap, but I, I probably added the numbers wrong. Right, what do you think the gap is in uh, ice hockey? What do you think that is? Any idea? Any thoughts? You've got to think outside the box here. Well, still, there's going to be 100%. Even if there are three schools that have them, or 30 schools that have them, or 3,000 schools that have them, it still should be 100%. If we've got, let's say we've got all the categories, all the racial and ethnic categories from the United States are covered here. We, we have them, but let's say they are. We've still got about a, you know, 5%. There's 5% of the, of the hockey players don't fit into any of these categories. How come? Brandon, how come? Correct, right? They're international, they're international players. Generally from Canada, but not only. Some also from Scandinavia, Western Europe. Uh, we'll see that w among the women, this gap is even bigger. Even, even a larger percentage of female ice hockey players at both Division I and Division III are not from the United States, which is neither here nor there, but it's interesting. I thought you'd be interested. Now, I could be wrong that it's not interesting, but I thought it was interesting. Is there anything else here that you, you, that you want to uh, ask about or talk about? Something that, that, that surprised, nothing else surprising you here or, or that you find uh, counterintuitive? Yeah, Dan? Well, so like a lot of times, um, I feel like in studies where you're using race as a proxy for class, like Asian populations are like considered kind of along with white populations to be generally like middle upper class, but they're still underrepresented across all sports. Yeah, well, you know, we're going to, it's going to look differently, though, at the D3 schools, which is interesting because I think you're right. Our use of these categories is really problematic. And you, not only is it a bad proxy for class, but it, sometimes it misses stuff about class. Because you're right. Uh, people who we might from, call uh, East Asian, right, Korean, Chinese, Japanese, are generally more well off financially than what we call the white population. Uh, but, but saying a Asia is a big place. Asia is, it's the biggest continent, isn't it? Uh, so people who are Asian come from all over the place, right? They're Lebanese, that's Asian. And half of Turkey is Asian. And Russia is Asian, part of it. Uh, so Asian is a, it's a terrible category. It's like Latino is a terrible category. <coughs> Black's a terrible category. Whites, they're all terrible categories. Let me just erase them. But this is what we do. This is what we have. All right, here's Division Three. I see the, the overrepresentation of African Americans in certain sports is much smaller here. It's still pretty large in basketball. It's noticeable in, in, uh, in football, but it's not nearly as large. Track is the other sport where African Americans especially are fairly well represented, sometimes overrepresented. Now, something to keep in mind. As we've, got, we've got things going on. It's a very complex procedure here where we have certain enduring racial and ethnic stereotypes that might be positive. Right? They may not be condemnations, but the association that say African Americans are very fast. And that's a, people would say, well, that's a compliment. Well, it's still a stereotype. Right? It's still a stereotype that's based on limited experience. It's based on the historical success of certain groups, certain groups, in certain sports. Well, it's not really what we call a random sample. Right? Because if African Americans or Latinos or whomever have been channeled into certain sports versus others, either through self-selection or through some outside force, then we get a misrepresentation of what's going on. Right? Add to the mix some social class. Patriarchy is involved here, because they're, you're going to see there are gender differences. Geography matters. What do you think in sports like soccer? Or lacrosse, how would geography matter? Even baseball, how would geography matter? What's going on with geography? Where's the, 
Where's the influence of geography? Bridget, I don't know if we talked about this yesterday. Did we talk about geography? <coughs> well, you know, locations in the country aren't as important as sort of the type of place you live. I'm trying not to give it away. No, not weather-wise. Not weather-wise. Uh, that's that-wise. That-wise. How do you think that matters? How do you think that matters? Put the pieces together here. Come on, impress me. Go ahead. Yeah, so certain sports need space. And if you have an overrepresentation of certain groups in, let's say, urban areas, then certain sports are just not going to flourish there. Sports like soccer or lacrosse, even baseball. Basketball can flourish there. You don't need as much space. So that's a, that's a structural phenomenon. Right? That's not something that, that's part of a culture. It's not part of, of heritage. It's not part of the way people were raised. It's, it's something that's it's a situational thing. Right, that room matters. The same one of the sports that I'm actually, <coughs> believe it or not, studying in this book is ultimate frisbee. I know some of you may not consider it a real sport. Uh, the people who play it do. Uh, but that's another sport that even though it's very, very egalitarian and has fairly low initial cost barriers, it needs space. And so the percentage of African Americans who play ultimate frisbee is practically non-existent. They just don't play. It's not part of the urban landscape uh, that much, although that might be changing. And the way higher education works, well, this is something I'm talking about in one of my other classes right now. This is what's driving the whole phenomenon, is the changing nature of higher education and the obsession of higher education with having a certain kind of brand, with having some external image, less concerned with the internal content of teaching and learning, much more interested in getting $25 million for a newly named law school. Right, that becomes the focus of our attention. You did hear that, right? Law school just got a huge, huge donation. It's going to be the something, something, the Rick Eckstein Law School now. I, I donated $25 million from my uh, ample, ample salary. All right, so D, this is D3 again. D3 men. Anything here that you find uh, interesting or or uh, thought-provoking in any way? Or is it all just what you expected? Come on now. Come on now. Don't be shy. Even smaller baseball here than, than on the other one, which was, which was pretty small to start with. Now you're going to see, no questions about this, because actually the women are, as with most things, women are more interesting and more important, right? How's that bagel? Yeah, it didn't look very good, actually. It looked kind of flat. Uh, so here are D1 women. And uh, the, the sports I'm studying in this, in this research project of mine are soccer, field hockey, figure skating, ice hockey, and ultimate frisbee. Uh, ultimate frisbee not here because there's no intercollegiate footprint at all. Figure skating has no intercollegiate footprint. Figure skaters, female figure skaters, are moving by droves. By droves or in droves? <coughs> Lots of them are moving from figure skating to ice hockey because of the presence of both scholarships and preferential admissions. Now, I've got this on the record from dozens of people who are involved in both figure skating and ice hockey. So this, this is why higher education is so important and the extra resources in higher education that are going toward intercollegiate athletics, because it's hooked up with this whole branding emphasis, rather than going toward other things. Like, uh, well, you, you, the dorms are great here, right? Aren't the dorms spectacular? Really? Like Marriott, suites, and uh, they're pretty fancy, aren't they? No, not, not so much? All right, anything here that you find interesting or, uh, or counterintuitive or strange or surprising? Nothing at all? I'm just reconfirming all of your, your pre-existing ideas? I hate when I do that. That's no fun at all. Nothing here at all? Nothing? Bridget, go, go. This gap. Yeah. Surprised at that gap? Yeah. Guess what the largest growing segment is if you break down field hockey by 
by state and country, the largest growing population of, of uh, Division I field hockey players are coming from where? In terms of growth. Specifically, yeah, <laughs> that's right. But they're coming from Europe and some parts of, of uh, Oceania. Right? They're, it's a big sport. Field hockey is a really big sport in a lot of the world. Here, of course, it's played by who in a lot of the world? Men. Right? So when men play it, it's got a certain legitimacy. Here, it's kind of here it was sort of created to be the female alternative to football, fall sport. N not in terms of what you do. Although, don't mess, any of you play field hockey at all? Don't mess with field hockey players. Those sticks are weapons, and they're, they're just brutal with them. Field hockey used to be, used to be, in the 1980s, in the wake of Title IX, it was one of the first intercollegiate sports for women that had a really large footprint. It was the largest intercollegiate sport for women for the longest time, well not the longest time, but for a couple years and then basketball caught up. Eventually soccer caught up. Soccer was minuscule at first. There are five really big intercollegiate sports for women that are represented in all 50 states and at the high school level also really, really big. What are they? Field hockey is not one of them anymore. What are the big five? Field hockey is very geographically limited. Most of you from the Northeast, right? Anyone not from the Northeast? Where are you from? Portland. Really? I love Portland. I was just there. I love it. Why were you here? Why did you leave Portland? Well, have you seen it? Yeah. What year are you in? Have you seen enough? Not quite yet. You will. If you don't go back to Portland, let me know where you live. I'll go back to Portland because I like Portland, and I've been here for a lot of years in the East. And so in the Northwest, they don't play much field hockey. Right. I know what it was. Right. So it's, it basically field hockey, if you look at the geography of field hockey, it sort of stops in parts of Ohio. It kind of trickles out when you're heading west. And then there's a little brief, a little brief surge in, in Michigan, just a little one. Only half of the state of Michigan plays it. I know a high school coach the only high school team in western Michigan. In all their games, they have to go across the state to play. Well, at least they don't have to go to Flint and <laughs> drink lead-infested water. But maybe they will one day. And if you go south, it pretty much stops in northern North Carolina. So that's the field hockey area. It's pretty similar to the area of what game, by the way? What, else, what game also has a geographically limited footprint like that? Which someone mentioned before. Lacrosse, right? Pretty much the same. It's a northeast centered game, although little pieces of it here and there. Denver, now USC, has a lacrosse program for women, uh, which they're trying, again, they try to use these things to balance out football, which, is, which seems to grow like a fungus and no matter where it is. So, so I, uh, field hockey is not one of the big five. What are the big five? What are the big five for women's intercollegiate sports? And this is the one that old people always get hung up on. You got the four easy ones. Track. Which one? Volleyball. Volleyball. Do we have a prize or something that we could give? Uh, how about a golf clap? That would be a little more appropriate. That's right. So those are the big five. They're, uh, they have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of programs. Twice to three times as many as field hockey and lacrosse, which are sort of in that second tier. So soccer, volleyball, track, basketball, and softball. Those are the big five. Ice hockey, though, right now is the fastest growing. Second fastest growing, lacrosse. Right, lacrosse and, and field hockey are going in opposite directions. Even though they're in the same geographic, geographic area, one is sort of in a steady state, maybe even contracting field hockey, and lacrosse is actually expanding. More and more schools are starting lacrosse programs. Ice hockey, though, not only is it expanding, but it has, at the D1 level, the scholarship levels are among the highest of any sport anywhere that isn't required to give full scholarships. Some sports, you have to give full scholarships full, at the full level of tuition, room, and board. Basketball is one. Football is one. Uh, uh, tennis, if you give the maximum number allowed by the NCAA, 
they have to be full, which I think is six. If you give fewer than six, you can split them up any way you want. Volleyball, if you give the maximum amount, which is either 12 or 14, you have to give them as full scholarships. If you give fewer than 12 or 14, which we do here, then you can split them up any way you want. But football and basketball have to be full scholarships. Hockey does not. In hockey, you get 18 what's called equivalencies, a maximum of 18. So you'll get the equivalent of 18 scholarships, which you can then divide up any way you want as a coach or as an athletic director. The average, the average uh, field hockey scholarship in, a, in amount is about $15,000. That's what people get. It's not $50,000. It's not $60,000. It's $15,000. Uh, for lacrosse, it's a little less. For softball, it's a little more. Soccer is also about fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars. For ice hockey, it's thirty-four thousand dollars is the average scholarship for a college student, a young woman who's playing Division One ice hockey on a scholarship. This is accounting for some of the draw from figure skating. Figure skating won't help you pay for college unless you're, I don't know, it just won't unless you're in Disney on ice. Right? Then you can do it. Any questions about this, the Division One? Before we go to the Division Three, which looks fairly similar. Right, smaller African American representation at Division Three female level than at the Division One female level. Not sure why that is, but it's it's fairly noticeable in most of the sports. Smaller, smaller African American <coughs> representation here. Smaller in softball. About the same in lacrosse. Yes, sir? Does Division III, do Division III sports offer uh, scholarships? No scholarships. Well, well, no, I'll put it this way. All right, no, no scholarships. All right, just like the Ivy League schools, which are Division I, they don't offer any scholarships either, athletic scholarships either. Right. Are you getting that on the camera? It's not just a twitch. Because uh, if, if one of the things that I've uncovered in this research when talking to athletes at Ivy League schools and Division III schools is that the schools, they find clever ways of coming up with financial aid. That's not an athletic scholarship, but it seems somehow tied to their skills as athletes. And then some of them, when they have quit their sport, all of a sudden find their financial aid package has been restructured somehow which when they ask about it says, well, we've restructured everyone's financial aid package. But there are other teammates who didn't quit whose <coughs> theirs wasn't restructured. So they don't have official scholarships, but they find ways. And what they do have, which may even be more important, especially the Ivy League schools, to a lesser extent at, at Division III schools, they've got these, the system of preferential admissions. Uh, you can be admitted with lower credentials, academic credentials, and ahead of time if you fit the needs of a program at a particular time. You're making faces like you, you know this happens, right? Yeah, a kid at my high school, well, I went to public school in Connecticut, but a kid at my high school got him to Yale. Idiot, right? took his SAT three times to get the minimum score they would let him get in with to play football. I was going was, was gonna to guess the sport. I'm sorry. Uh, ice hockey. Uh, football. Different sports bend differently. And the Ivy League schools, they bend the most for football and even more so for ice hockey. If he was an ice hockey player, he might not even have had to take the test a couple extra times. They might have just brought him in, taken his pulse, seen that he was alive. All right, if he was a good left wing and they needed a left wing, that could have been enough. All right, fall, okay, can you do that? All right? Chew gum, walk, something. In other parts of the country that are not Ivy League, football and basketball traditionally have the greatest gap, we might call the credential gap, between <coughs> athletes, recruited athletes, and non-athletes. Right? It is, in essence, an affirmative action program for athletes. It's preferential treatment for athletes. That, and there's been research done on this. You get almost two, you get two to three times the admissions advantage being a recruited athlete than you do being a legacy or being a member of a traditionally underrepresented group. Uh, so this is just something to keep in mind. Bridget, we're going to be doing this stuff in class in, a, in about a month and a half. All right, so so be, be ready for it. 
us two, about a month and a half. Right. So, so you saw the one person. And my daughter had to deal with someone who uh, got admitted to uh, Amherst College, which is where she wanted, one of the places she wanted to go. And this guy, he was, he was he's just an idiot. <laughs> he's just stupid. Not, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't say that on TV, but he's stupid. He's stupid. He's dumb. He does not belong in a really challenging school like that. He doesn't belong here. But he got an Amherst because he's a good soccer player. And he's struggling, struggling mightily there to survive. But he got in. And a lot of the people didn't because they weren't good. I think he's a, a midfielder. And they needed a midfielder or something. So that matters. Is, the, is your acquaintance still playing football at Yale? Yeah, as far as I know. I don't know if he's there anymore. No. She's a year older than me. There was another girl who went to Yale that year, too. She, she played football played also? Smarter. She probably got in like mm -hmm. somewhat legitimately, but she played softball. Well, it helps. Yeah. It helps more at the Ivies even than at the D3s. But in, that, in some conferences, right, you've heard of this, this NESCAC conference, which includes Amherst and Bowdoin and Colby and all. They're very serious about this stuff. Go ahead. Uh, you know someone else who got no, into it? No, I'm going to go to Connecticut College, and he always talks about it. Now, Connecticut College, as schools in that conference go, they're all on the mellow side. Yeah, they don't like having people. No, and then, yeah, they're, they're a little more laid back. But Williams and Amherst and Middlebury are out of their minds. Uh, they are obsessed with having championship teams in as many sports as possible. Right? And in a place like Williams, 40% of the students at Williams College are on an inter intercollegiate team. 40%. That's a lot. Uh, and so that's part of their identity. It's part of their brand. And so they make accommodations for people. You know anyone who's going to one of those three schools? Since you're from Connecticut. No. You're in the thick of it there. Surprisingly, no. Trinity is trying to be... Uh, yeah, we used to get a good Yeah, they're trying to use sports to put themselves up in that class uh, instead of using other things. All right, any, uh, any questions about this? Uh, more questions? Or, or Brendan, have you got something there? Um, in the areas where like field hockey and ice hockey and lacrosse aren't fast growing, what is usually taking the place of those? You mean in terms of being big or in terms of growth? In terms of growth and just dominating them. Well, soccer's growing everywhere. Uh, soccer continues to grow. Softball seems to be in a holding pattern. <laughs> Volleyball is growing. And that's nationwide now. I think maybe volleyball is the one that's spreading to places that it might not have been popular. They're play, probably playing volleyball at the collegiate level in Oregon. Yes? Yeah, I know gymnastics. Ah, they just added a new sport at the University of Oregon for women. It's not gymnastics exactly. That's right. Acrobatic tumble, acro, tumbling. Acrobatic tumbling. What's it? It's called acro tumbling. Acro tumbling. Right. Why use two words when you can combine them into one? Acro tumbling. So there's no equipment involved. You just fall around, right? You tumble. You tumble, like, which is fun. Tumbling around is fun on mats. That's what we do when we're kids. It's fun. <laughs> and they just added it, I think, a year or two ago. But there's so many schools that do it, they've got to travel to, I think they've got to meet against Valparaiso in Indiana. Now that's like Indiana and Baylor. Baylor, yes. Yeah. We've been reading the same stuff. It's pretty exciting. I used to competitive cheer in high school. So. Competitive cheer. That's growing. That's growing. Competitive cheerleading is growing, which is sort of gymnastic-ish. That's sort of what people think about it as. It's growing. It's growing very fast. It may, Brendan may be growing faster than any other sport outside of you know, what's going on here with lacrosse in the Northeast and ice hockey in the colder regions. They don't have, Arizona State recently started an ice hockey program for men. They also have, have to travel long distances to play games. Because most of the schools in the in the, in the Pac-12, as the hockey's not real big there yet, but I bet it, it could be. It could be one day they can tumble and then play hockey. Be the same thing. Uh, anything else about this? You can write to see the gaps again. This is from international students. This is this is really big. This is uh, you know it's uh, at one point it's starting to shrink now. I think because the scholarship levels are so high, and more and more figure skaters are coming over to ice hockey, so they're getting enough domestically to to close that gap. But for a while, 10 years ago, when ice hockey was first starting, 10 to 15 years ago, as a women's sport, it was dominated by mostly young Canadian women. Made up the bulk of the, and of course, a lot of the schools that play it are right there on the board. You sort of slip across. And uh, 
that, of course, you're responsible for higher tuition costs if you're out of state at a place like Minnesota Duluth. So that's also going to elevate the tuition, or the scholarship levels that we talked about before, if you remember that far back. Any questions about this? Anything else about this? All right, here's the, uh, here's the we're going to take this in a slightly different direction now, but it all has to do with the same idea of a pipeline. Because right, one thing that the pipeline does, this youth sports to college pipeline, is it also dumps into the national teams. Right, we have a very rare phenomenon in this country. The United States is the only country in the world that has organized, institutionalized intercollegiate athletics. That's it. No one has it. No one else has it. So all the people who are on the U.S. national team, this is the World Cup team, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute, it's been updated. She got cut. Sorry. Uh, so we've gone from two African American women to one. And Sydney LaRue is a really interesting case in and of herself. Anyone know Sydney LaRue's story? We should put, we should put an asterisk next to Sydney LaRue. She, she just married some other soccer player. Real hunky, hunky guy. Looked like me. Sydney LaRue was born in Canada. This is, this is, like, a, this is like a Ted Cruz story. Right? Sydney LaRue was born in Canada to a Canadian woman and uh, an American father who was African American, played a couple years of professional baseball, I think. Ring a bell or anything in the 80s, before you guys were born. So she was living in Canada. And when she was 14 or so, she decided, because she really liked soccer, that she'd get a better soccer experience in the United States. So she, just her, she picked up and she moved to Arizona and lived with this family who was, one of the, who was involved with this elite soccer club, and she started playing with them. Now, she was, she was a dual citizen, but she had the financial wherewithal in Canada, because uh, they weren't poor, but she could actually pick up and move herself to Glendale, Arizona, and play soccer there, and then she went to UCLA and eventually uh, joined the women's national team. So, so she wasn't, it's not like she was coming from, uh, you know, some place in, in New York or Newark or Hartford or Bridgeport or New Haven or Boston. Uh, she's from v Vancouver, British Columbia. That's where she grew up. And, uh, and uh, Crystal Dunn is from Long Island. She's one of, she's one of my paisans. And she ended up going, she goes to college at the University of North Carolina, which is a pretty big soccer school. Oh, and I don't know why she got cut, but apparently she was pissed off when she didn't make the, the World Cup team. So this is, the women's World Cup team is very, very, very white. And as far as I can tell from checking on their, where they grew up and looking at the census in terms of the income levels in those areas, they are not, let's say they are above the national median in terms of family income. They're families, not them necessarily now because they're poor, they don't get paid very much. Now with field hockey, it's the same. Uh, the national field hockey team is completely white. Now again, I think this is more social class than it is race and ethnicity, but it still expresses itself pretty clearly. If you can't get into that pay to play pipeline, I don't, every single one of these played division one, I think one or two played division three college, so they all played big time college programs. You don't get into that pipeline and go through college somehow, because that's where you apprentice now in college, unlike the rest of the world where you apprentice just out in the community somewhere on a field hockey team or on a soccer team, you're not going to make the national team. And the U.S. national women's field hockey team is, is as uncompetitive internationally as the soccer team is competitive internationally. Although at some point, uh, the rest of the world's going to catch up with soccer. Now here's uh, these four, uh, I tell you to do figure skating, right? These four people represented uh, the U.S., these four women, at uh, the World Figure Skating Champions. Oh, nope, she got cut, sorry. Uh, she was apparently a stronger skater than, than this one. I, I don't remember her names. Uh, but somehow she got cut, and, and she went to wherever the worlds were. I, I, this has been a real pain, this trying to be interested in figure skating, which I'm just simply not. But I've had to pretend for the sake of this project. So figure skating, too. But figure skating's always been this way, right? There's no myth about figure skating. 
the way there is about these other sports that you can use. Right? That's the rhetoric. That's, the, that's that, that sort of rags to riches thing that we hear. Sports is a way for poor people to access a college education that maybe they couldn't have otherwise. But the reality, except in a couple of sports, in a couple of places, doesn't work out. Right? It's actually probably reinforcing existing class inequalities. Rather than making people more mobile, it's probably hindering social mobility. Right? So sports and race and class and mobility they all go together, and, and gender. Uh, I could not find a decent picture of the US women's under 23 ultimate Frisbee team. But I've seen individual, I would have had to paste 22 individual pictures. Uh, of those 22 players, 18 are white, four are, again, we would call them Asian Pacific Islander. And almost all of them, almost all of them are from which part of the country? do you think? Frisbee's really hot in certain parts of the country. Do you know where it's really hot? It's two hotbeds for Frisbee right now, for ultimate Frisbee. Villanova's not one of them. It's big in the Pacific Northwest, right? Ultimate Frisbee. Who's the women's Division I national champion in ultimate Frisbee? You don't know. You don't know. You don't know? It's the University of Oregon. The fugue, they call themselves. The fugue. This is not an intercollegiate sport. You know, in order to find them, you've got to go through student life and through club sports. And then they're lodged down there along with uh, Quidditch or something. Right there. <laughs> they were, they were like right under they're Quidditch, Ultimate Frisbee. They're all, they're all listed there. Uh, Seattle, Portland, big hot spots for Ultimate Frisbee. Now, you might not know that unless you actually played it. But it's big. And uh, the Boston area is another, another big spot. So even in a sport like Ultimate Frisbee, very egalitarian, very open-minded, uh, very accommodating, very accepting. The people who play it, and then there's a variety of reasons for this, which we could talk about if you want. Uh, there's exclusion going on there, too. It's exclusion. It's class-based exclusion that has a racial and ethnic component to it. Uh, so that's all I got for you. So I was hoping we could, we could chat about things. Or if not, you can, you can go get a bagel or, or do what you want. You guys got any questions or comments, anything you want to talk about with this or anything even slightly related to this? This is just a little tiny piece <coughs> of a much larger project. So uh, what's on your mind? Anything? Anything you saw? You getting ACS credit for this or something? Is that why you're here? That have to be some ulterior mode. Moldy make you come? Is that, that what this? Uh, we are ACS done. It's ACS. All right. Just as long as you're honest. Well, I, don't, I don't mind you being forced to come here. That's, that's fine. Some of you are too old for ACS, though. Brandon, what are you doing here? You got lost, didn't you? Yeah. You were looking for the bar, and, and you ended <laughs> up here. So what, what, what? There must be something on your minds. Spiritually, there must be something on your minds. We were talking about this for an hour yesterday. This is, you've got to be all excited about this now, in an intellectual sort of way. Anything, anything here? No? Nothing? It's all interesting, but, but you want to talk about anything more? What would you like to talk about? Um, do you have any theories on the decline for, of African American players from Division One to Division Three, specifically in like the basketball or football? Area? Why there are fewer? Yeah, in the Division Three, because you would like you would think that okay, like it might be easier to attain to when there be a larger population. Yeah, that's that's a that's a great question. Right, the rest you can leave. That's that's, a, <laughs> that's just a great question. Yeah, I have a theory on this. I have a theory. On it. I have, I have, I'm going to speculate. See what you think about this. <coughs> I think there's a lack of information about the opportunities for going to a D3 school and getting an education. And, and I'm, not, I'm not defending the system of preferential admissions, because right? it'll make you mad if I defend it. I, I'm not. And, and I, you know, I have a daughter who could probably get one of those things to a D3 school in soccer, but I won't let her. And she, so I, I won't let her play club and go to showcases and all that stuff. She just plays for the high school and that's it. And she gets in, she gets in. She plays, she plays. Because I'm a man of moral principles. Unless there's money involved. And, and then, I can, then I can bend. Uh, so I don't think people know that these D3 schools and Ivy League schools will bend. Right? If, you're coming out of a, if you're coming out of an educational system that maybe isn't, isn't quite as strong as a suburban one, let's say. Uh, 
and you think, well, there's no way I'm going to be able to get into Trinity College. No way I'm going to be able to get into Princeton. I just don't have the, the skills. My school was bad, and I, there were no, well, I don't have AP classes to wave around as though that somehow is, is a magic wand. Let's take an AP class, and of course you must be smarter than people who didn't take a class that teaches to a test that costs $105. Uh, schools wave there. That's part of high schools branding themselves, right? Oh, we have 55,000 people who took the AP exams last year and scored a four or five. Uh, so I think it's people don't know. People don't know that they got a real crack at getting into one of these smaller schools. I think the culture has informed them to think college sports big. And that's where most of the visibility is. Now, you, don't even, you might not even know that Yale has a football team or that Connecticut College does not, even though other schools in, in this small Division III conference did. Uh, but Connecticut was... How many colleges do you I thought that when I visited they there. Units, like, bathrooms that were like, they share, like, they share, just male and female share the same bathroom on their floor. I have a problem with that. That's what happens at home. So <laughs> once you guys grow up and, and have families and stuff, you'll see. <laughs> Gender doesn't matter in the bathrooms at home. Right. Leaving the seat up and putting it down, that's what matters. I wonder if they put the seat up. When I, went, when I was visiting Connecticut College and touring it with my daughter, and I had liked it at first, and then I decided I didn't like it because it, it, I kept seeing these signs. It was reminding me of Villanova. There, there was a sign that said, uh, you, you get like a printing limit. And there was a big sign in the library that said, don't go over your limit or we'll kick your ass or something. It was really, really rude. I said, geez, that sounds like Villanova. Nickel and diamond people. And then there was, uh, we were in the dorms, and I saw one of these bathrooms that you were talking about. And then the, the, the no, it wasn't the tour guide, it was some student, because I always hit up, you know, I hit up, sorry. I, I chat up the students, and, and one of them told me, if you forget your key, and public safety has to come, 25 bucks. First time, 25 bucks. I said, yeah, that sounds like Villanova. <laughs> Nickel and dime. So I said, you can't go to, a, you can't go to Villanova, and you can't go to Villanova light. You can't do that. Right, so Connecticut was off, even though I liked the view. You can see the view of the sound. It's, it's nice. Yeah. He complained about them not having sports all the time. Oh, he, he wants more sports. Yeah, I, I don't think he wants like that athlete environment of like, people getting in. Yeah. Might not be at the same academic level. Right. Or, like, that kind of stuff. I think he just misses that after experience all the time. Because I talk about like, going with that. Yeah. He kind of like, wishes he had that. But you don't talk about. Villanova rowing, right? Because there aren't a lot of people, there aren't thousands of people on the banks of the Schuylkill watching the regattas, right? Yeah, but we have, there's no, there's no uh, uh, scholarships for, for rowing, but there's uh, 44 slots for women rowers. So back to the original question, I don't think people know about it. I, I think if, uh, if people who were coming from some disadvantaged backgrounds knew about the opportunities that were available at smaller schools, if they didn't mind the smallishness and sharing bathrooms or whatever, then I'll bet those numbers would change. And I'll bet the schools would be accommodating because I think they would like to change their demographics a little bit and for some reason think that sports is the way to do it. I think the schools are wrong for doing that, but not the people. Right? The, the, the people who are reading the tea leaves are reading them correctly, but they're being exaggerated. The, the schools exaggerate the likelihood of getting a scholarship. The industry, the youth sports industry, exaggerates the likelihood of getting a scholarship or getting preferential admissions to these schools. <coughs> the business. They're trying to sell the pipeline. And if, if you ever go to a soccer conference and look at the exhibition hall where all these vendors are, are operating, it's, it's stunning, the things that they're trying to sell people. It's just unbelievable. Does this it's mean it's, it's like, are we out of time? Is that why everyone's, it's just like in class. Is it time to go? I have no idea what time it is. What time? What time? Is it time? You know what time? I'll go look at the clock. Be that way. How about we stay for five more minutes if anyone has time? 11 would be good. I don't want to stay. I got things to do. Uh, any, any of that? That was a good question. Thank you. Any, any, anything else on your mind? Where do you want to put on your mind? Uh, beyond like social class, do you think that culture has? Yeah, 
yeah, I, I think cultural background is going to emphasize what you think your best options are uh, in terms of giving your kids a leg up in getting into the college of their choice or a college at all. Uh, so the emphasis on sports might be more prominent with certain uh, cultural backgrounds. Emphasis on music might be big. Now, there is no preferential admissions given to alto saxophone players or uh, aspiring journalists. And, th and think of it just in terms of language, right? We've got this, we've got this neat little term for intercollegiate athletes, right? They've got their own little name, <coughs> don't they? What do we call them? What do we call them? You guys have to use this term when you're referring to yourselves or the code. They have to use this term. What do we call them? Student athletes, right? Student, that's, that's law. That's law. If you're over in athletic administration and you don't use the term student athlete, if you just use athlete or something, you get a, like a shock. You, you get tasered if you don't use that term. And the NCAA invented that term in the 1950s to fend off a worker, discrim a, a worker compensation case in football. Colorado A&M. School doesn't even exist anymore. And it's stuck. But we don't talk about student journalists uh, for people who work on, did any of you work on the school paper or the yearbook or anything like that? Did any of you do anything? <laughs> what, what, what do you do? Does anyone do anything that's not sports related, extracurricular? What, what do you do? You must do something. What do you do? Debate. Debate. All right. So we don't, we don't uh, say, oh, well, you're a student debater or a student forensic, forensicer. Uh, we could do that. We could give you your own title and say, well, you know, all the time that you spend on debate, represent, you represent our school, don't you? But you don't have a special status. You don't get preferential admissions for that. It might be something along the whole laundry list of things that you do, you know, that this community serves, that community serves. Of course, my AP classes, eight languages, this and that, and I'm, I'm a debater. Right? But that's not going to help. There's no, there's no slots set aside. Like Connecticut College, they've got slots. They're given slots per team. And you could have really lousy grades, but the coach can use that slot as long as you over some minimum threshold. Uh, but they don't do that for debaters or journalists or... Brendan, did you, you, for, for, you, you play an instrument, right? I do. I don't know. But you didn't get any admissions advantage for it. No. Because you, you really sucked. Right? So it doesn't help. But that wouldn't matter, right? It wouldn't matter. So that th these, these things, we don't, we don't have separate classes. We, we should have different names for, for each of you for what you do.